para volver de... Ok, So I have to give a big thank you to Paul because he, he demonstrated very, 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 very good interest in collaborating with us, okay? And the second DNS is Paul Vixi and a lot of things around DNS were uh, defined by him. One of the first exploits I ever tested in my life was Vixi CronTap exploit, the tool that Paul developed. So you have one of the biggest uh, persons in internet. So here you have Paul, they are yours. Thank you, good afternoon. Uh, very kind introduction. Um, it uh, takes very little effort to get me to go to Hong Kong, so thank you for that. Um, I'm gonna talk about security today. Uh, first, I need to clean up a few misunderstandings. I did not invent DNS. Uh, Paul Macapetris invented DNS. Uh, he's a good friend. I took over a lot of DNS after he left academia to go and do commercial things. So I spent about 20 years working on it. So a lot of the bugs in early versions of Bind were my fault. Uh, I started a company, Internet Systems Consortium, that um, was started for the purpose of owning the copyright to Bind. Um, and uh, it's still there, I am I'm now divorced from it. But, um, but in any case, I, I had a lot to do with DNS, but uh, not uh, I didn't invent it. Um, what else? Yes, if you don't have uh, systemd yet, if you still have cron on your laptop, it's probably mine. Um, and it hasn't had a uh, serious security vulnerability reported in it uh, for uh, 15 years. So uh, I feel pretty good about that. And uh, really, who knew about the effective UID? Uh, okay. So security is related very much to uh, reliability. Uh, you'd say that something was secure if it was doing what you wanted. Um, but more specifically, you'd say it was secure if it wasn't doing what you didn't want. Um, but because you don't always know what you don't want, we actually say that it's secure if it's not doing anything you wouldn't want if you knew what it was. Um, you may see some elasticity in uh, the definition of security uh, by those three successive definitions. Um, this is important and will become more so as I, as I speak uh, because a lot of what we're doing in the security industry, and I am the CEO of a security company, so I am uh, partly to blame for this, a lot of what we do in the security industry today uh, is to try to secure things that we don't understand. Uh, this isn't going to work, and I'm here to tell you why it won't work. Uh, Miko has already given most of my best material in his talk. If I'd known he was going to be here, I might not have come. Um, although he's an optimist. Uh, he's telling you that something can be done, and I'm telling you uh, something else. So uh, perhaps he and I can have a panel later in the week. This is a real product for sale right now on the Internet. You can go to Amazon. Um, and uh, what it will do, if you plug this in, uh, you put this between a power outlet. These are US style power outlets, but I'm sure they have a, a European version. Uh, you put this between a power outlet and your home gateway. So you have some small plastic box that came to you with your DSL connection, or maybe you're using it as a Wi-Fi gateway. Uh, it probably came from a company like D-Link or Linksys, or maybe it has no name at all. It just came to you from your phone company. Um, and the problem this solves is that your home gateway hangs. Just at random intervals, it will stop working. And uh, this is a way to fix that by turning it off for a few minutes every day. And uh, this is absurd. This is nuts. Uh, not just that this device costs more than the gateway it's protecting, uh, not just that this is another device that is itself likely to have bugs or itself hang. I mean, how many of these are you going to put in serial in order to make sure that they are all reliable? 
uh, but that we are so despondent over the quality of that home gateway that we are willing to fix it with this rather than go buy a better one. We know there isn't a better one. We know there's never going to be a better one. So um, this did make something more reliable. I don't know that it made it more secure. So I have a number of uh, cutouts from uh, just screenshots that I've taken in the last year or so uh, when I started on this particular train of thought because I wanted real-world examples of technology like that reset device uh, in order to illustrate a point. Um, and uh, it's what you're seeing here is simply Apple worrying about its supply chain. Uh, and they should. They actually uh, kicked Supermicro out of the Siri data center because there was a malicious piece of firmware uh, available for download for updating the firmware on Supermicro motherboards. That malicious piece of firmware is still on the Supermicro website. I use Supermicro. Um, because I'm not as sensitive to my supply chain as Apple is, but they really should be worried about this kind of thing. We all should be worried about this kind of thing. This was the, my, my favorite thing that I saw that month. Um, this comes from uh, some people, I think in Michigan, uh, who added one capacitor to a small uh, industrial control processor. So this has a CPU, it has memory, it has some IO drivers and so on. And they added one capacitor. Uh, and the effect of that one capacitor, I'm sorry, I'm having some trouble with the sound. Uh, the effect of that one capacitor is that if you run a certain data pattern through a certain register, in a certain order, at a certain speed, it will charge that capacitor to a certain level, which will uh, enable the privilege ring. So uh, basically, it's a way to get uh, root access to this chip from user mode uh, just by running data through a certain part of it in, in a certain pattern that uh, obviously you have to know what the pattern is. Um, and this is something that you can do, you, you've probably heard about uh, doing this with memory sticks where you can run patterns through uh, adjacent rows in a, uh, a, a sim in order to change the contents of adjacent memory, but this is even better. Uh, this was done as a proof of concept because the way that you would go about finding this, if you were, let's say, Apple, and you're trying to decide whether a given chip that you were thinking about incorporating into your device had a problem like this, would be X-ray lithography. In other words, take the chip, stick it into a microscope, you know, basically uh, use acid, get, uh, get all the, the junk off the chip so that you can actually see the wafer and see what's there. And the problem is the capacitor doesn't show up in X-ray lithography. There is not a way to look at this and determine that this capacitor is there. So when we talk about uh, verifying our supply chains and we think about all the other companies that would love to you know, get some spyware into our devices or maybe foreign governments or maybe our own government, and you start to think about how you would actually verify it, uh, it turns out that what the military does is they make the chips themselves in secure foundries. Um, and that's not just the U.S. military, that's any military anywhere, um, because they don't want it to be that uh, their devices are responding to signals from people who are not them, and that there is only one way to do that, and that is to build the whole chip yourself. There just isn't a verification capability here. Now, there might be one in the future. Maybe they'll get uh, more uh, exact microscopes. Maybe we'll be able to actually pull this apart and uh, make sure that it really does correspond to the design that we thought it was uh, etched from. But even then, are you gonna do that to every chip? Or are you gonna sample the lot? You're gonna say, okay, I've got a pallet full of these things. How many am I gonna destroy? What will my costs be to audit that part of my supply chain? And what you'll start to see is that even militaries are gonna be spending a huge amount of money doing this, and Apple's not gonna be able to keep up. And Apple's a pretty rich company. So, um, as you, if you read the news and you read a lot of different uh, sort of electronic magazines and um, study 
the development of the hardware, not just what feature is new or what the price levels are going to be or what the density of RAM is going to be. You can find things like this. Um, and uh, Miko already mentioned that uh, there's a lot of VNC. If you do a scan of the IPv IPv4 address space, you'll find an awful lot of virtual network consoles. And uh, quite a few of those will not have passwords. And uh, the part that I didn't hear Miko say is that if you start to try to notify people and say, hey, did you know that I can see your baby sleeping, they're more likely to call the police because they think you're the problem than they are going to call their vendor to find out how to set the password. So uh, fixing this is hard. Uh, so let's do a little bit of math. If you had a certain complexity, in other words, uh, some number of things that you have, and of those, some small fraction of them that you really understand, and then you increase the number on the bottom, which is the total number of devices you have, without increasing the number on the top, uh, then your total fraction is going to go down. Your level of understanding of your own equipment base, uh, you, uh, whatever the inventory is of your software, your hardware, your devices, your network, will go down. Um, and this seems obvious, but a lot of people who make buying decisions for uh, large corporations and even some families can't do math at this level. Um, what you're supposed to do is increase the top as often as you increase the bottom so that your fraction gets no worse and ideally over time gets better. So here's a security company, Trend Micro, um, and I got nothing against Trend. They, they've got smart people working there um, who uh, told us all about the HID door controller problem. Um, uh, so it wasn't their bug, they were simply reporting it. Um, HID is uh, one of those little things that's next to a door, and you back up to it with your wallet, and it clicks the door, then you can you know, get into the room. Uh, and here, in other words, it's a hardware device meant to create a secure environment. It creates perimeters, like the front of your building or the computer room or whatever, uh, where the device that you bought to get that security uh, capability added to your, your building is itself the source of one of your problems because, of course, it has a computer inside. Um, why it needs a computer inside is a mystery to me. Perhaps that's just what they teach you in design school. Um, but pretty much, if there's going to be a computer in there, you know there's going to be a problem. And let me just say, if you have a counterexample to my next statement, I want to hear it. Just stand up and shout it out. All software has bugs. Some we don't know about yet. Most we don't know the day we ship it. But all software in the history of humanity so far has had bugs. Anybody? No. So um, given that you know that's going to be the case, you really need to be setting yourself up for a buggy environment. And a lot of people don't. So. In, at least in the U.S. economy, one of the most expensive things you can do is uh, buy something for a hospital because there will be an extra layer of regulation and auditing and stuff that uh, goes into the creation of these devices. Uh, I first encountered this when we were fighting the Conficker virus or worm, depending on how you call it, uh, back in 2008-2009 time frame. Uh, because at some point, you know, we had 11 million unique IPs a day checking into the, the um, uh, honeypot, and we thought that's, that's a lot, and we've been notifying people for a year, and it's not going down. So somebody just got angry and said, I'm going to start making phone calls. And somebody else said, 11 million is a lot of phone calls. Well, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give it a couple hours, see what I can do. His third phone call was to a hospital, and the hospital put him through to a sysadmin, and the sysadmin said, ah, yes, uh, you're, you're asking about you know, IP address thus and so, you know, certain uh, dotted quad. Um, yes, I know that's infected with Conficker. No, I can't fix it. It's a portable x-ray machine, and it is inside of an operating room. And if we change the software, then the uh, Food and Drug Administration has to recertify it. And uh, that's not going to happen. It's running Windows XP. It's always going to be running Windows XP. 
Uh, and uh, for different reasons, they couldn't take it off the network. But the point is, these devices have a lot of inertia. Uh, they're, they are hard to build, they're hard to maintain, they're impossible to patch, and they cost a lot. And here was a device that was meant to control the supply of drugs, controlled substances. So there's a lot of things in hospitals uh, that are pills that will make you feel good. And so you can sell them on the uh, open market to people who want to feel good, even though they were originally intended for um, you know, uh, some medical purpose. And so this device was meant to keep those pills behind essentially tiny little locked doors until you had completed some kind of an auditing protocol to say, yes, I have a physician's approval, yes, I'm authorized, yes, I've got a second set of eyes, yes, the pills are not going to be sold out in the parking lot, and so on. Um, so this is a device that probably costs, oh, I don't know, let's just put a rough estimate on it, uh, 400,000 US dollars. And it's the size of an apartment refrigerator uh, and the actual parts cost, the actual, you know, what it took to get the metal and the silicon and the chips and so forth is probably less than $1,000. So the $399,000 there is because it's a medical device. This has a really, really high profit margin. So if anybody anywhere was going to have a QA budget, it would be them. And they didn't. There were 1,400 vulnerabilities found in just one of these. One assumes that the others are now being tested because other people are going to want to get their names in the paper. Now, I'm going to go on. I have, uh, I have another 40 of these, uh, and I have comments to make about each one. But the trend that I hope you're starting to establish uh, is that things are not getting better. And the more of this technology that we push sort of out of the lab and into our houses and into hospitals and into businesses and so forth, the less safe we're becoming. Um, I hope to leave you today with the sense that that trend will continue uh, until something truly terrible happens, uh, because that's the only way you can get people's attention. When I first started talking about open source, uh, it was BSD then, not Linux. Uh, but I remember making the point that um, it's much better to publish your software in terms of uh, the, the overall security, to publish your software, put it in the hands of everybody, and give them all a chance to look for bugs. Because yes, there will be some bad people who will find some bugs, but uh, you'll have more eyes, more total eyes on your code, uh, and therefore more good people who will look at the code and report bugs in it. And uh, this was the mantra. This is what we said. Uh, you know, believe it or not, operating systems didn't used to be free, and you didn't used to have the source code to them. Some of you in the audience look old enough to remember those days. Um, and in, in those days, uh, we've sometimes faced criticism from established companies whose operating systems were not available in source code, where they would say, we're more secure because nobody can look for bugs. Okay, well. That, that ignores disassembly, that ignores fuzz testing, that ignores an awful lot of stuff, but mostly it just ignores the fact that uh, sunlight is a good disinfectant. If you have a lot of people looking at the code, it's, you're going to find more bugs faster. But that was then and this is now. And what we have now is tens, hundreds of millions of lines of source code out there and about the same total number of people looking at it now as we had in 1995, right? Because you're not all going to go home and spend a bunch of time auditing source code. You're not just going to go pull, out, pull down some random tarball and start poking through it, hoping to get your name in the papers. You have other stuff to do. And so the number of people who are actually going to do that is about the same as a fixed constant now as it was 20 years ago. Uh, but the number of lines of code has gone up by a factor of at least 10 million. So we are outnumbered. And the old rule where more eyeballs equaled more security isn't working. And I don't think that trend is going to come back. I don't think that the lines are going to cross the other direction again. I believe that the, those trend lines are relatively level. So here we had a Linux bot. Um, and you know we all know that uh, Linux is quite popular, and a lot of people use it. It's in almost everything. It's not particularly bad as code goes. Uh, but like all code, it has bugs. 
Apple uh, charges $1,000 for their latest iPhone 6, and a lot of that money is going into various shareholders' pockets and executives' pockets and so forth. In other words, it's profit. And so, as with the medical example I gave earlier, if anybody anywhere was going to have a budget that would cover quality assurance testing, red team testing, fuzz testing, it would be Apple. Far more likely to be Apple than Motorola or Lenovo or anybody else, because Apple's not in a race to the bottom. They, they don't care what the commodity price of that device is. They expect you to pay more because you want to, which is a great trick, which I'd like to learn. But um, this was uh, some code that they had that would render text messages. And, you know, Apple has got a lot of good engineers. Uh, they uh, wanted to make sure that there was a consistent user experience and they didn't want to rewrite the same code uh, to do similar things all over the, the, the OS. They had a library that would sort of poke through a text string looking for markers indicating which parts were supposed to be underlined, which parts were supposed to be in green, which parts were supposed to blink, and so forth. And this code was used even on inbound SMS messages. And this code had a parser bug, which involved an overflow, which involved a stack crash, which meant that by sending somebody an SMS, you could get root on their phone. Um, again, if anybody in the world was going to get this right, it would have been Apple. If anybody is ever going to get this right, it would have been Apple by now. Um, I think I could go on endlessly with these uh, examples of uh, here's a firewall device that uh, ended up having a vulnerability. I do want to say firewall devices are in a catbird position. They are right at the edge of your network. They are great launch points for other attacks. So being able to subvert one is uh, a, a, a very good prize for an attacker. Uh, in other words, they are the things that ought to be audited the hardest by their manufacturers before they reach your hands. Let's check this again. Same fraction, different variables. Um, if you're going to be adding more devices to your network, more technologies, you're going to adopt, I don't know, blockchain, you're going to adopt something, uh, you have got to make the corresponding investment uh, on the top side of this fraction. In other words, the uh, total fraction of what you understand has to go up, or at least it can't go down. And uh, when people are making buying decisions and they're thinking about what is their budget and how many years will it last and how do they depreciate it and so forth, they are not doing anything about the top side of that fraction. They're simply buying whatever new feature they want because they need it, or because they want it, or, or, or what have you, and they're not realizing that part of the total cost of ownership is either going to be an investment on the top side of this fraction, which is the, their corporate understanding level of what they're buying, or it's going to be hidden in the form of losses and uh, having to pay ransoms to get their, uh, their files unscrambled and so forth. I thought, you know, Domino's knows what business it's in. Domino's makes pizza. I don't know if they make them here, but uh, it's a very common thing in college towns in the U.S. Uh, to call up Domino's and say, I want a pizza, and they'll bring it to you in 30 minutes. Uh, and you know, pizza is all they do. And you would think that this would be the one thing that, uh, since it's all they do, they would have made sure that there was no bug in the application by which college students could get free pizza. Uh, but there were millions of dollars of pizza lost to this app. So um, I want to make a departure. This isn't all about ones and zeros. Um, the, uh, the thing that people will do is fairly often they'll see that everybody else is doing some new thing and they'll say, I want to do that too so that I can have whatever benefit that I perceive that they are getting or I just want to be cool uh, or I don't want to be left out. And antibacterial soaps are literally a hand soap that comes in a dispenser. You, you, know, you push the, the thing and it squeezes out some liquid and you wash your hands. Uh, but it is impregnated with triclosan, which is a chemical that is particularly caustic if you are a single-celled animal. So um, if you wash your hands with this stuff, 
then um, in addition to all the dirt that will go down the drain, you will have a bunch of dead bacteria. Um, and the bacteria that stays on your hands is likely also to be dead. So it does give you some minor bit of safety if bacteria is one of your threat models. But here's the problem. Um, it only kills the weak bacteria. Uh, and if you have, uh, I guess it doesn't have the number here, but if you have something that's going to kill 98 point something percent of germs that it comes in contact with, Shouldn't you be worried that you're now dominating the eco, the, 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 the biosystem in your sewer system uh, you know, as the, the sludge flows away from your house with the 1.5% of bacteria who were the strongest and who no longer have to compete for light or food or anything else with the weak ones, which you've helpfully killed? In other words, you're making your situation worse uh, one hand wash at a time. And there was a, a moment where this was so fashionable in the United States that uh, I was unable to find non-antibacterial soap in any of the local grocery stores. And I, I hunted pretty hard. Uh, this is starting to reverse. But uh, when, when there is a fad, uh, everybody wants to, to be part of that. There's a bandwagon, people want to get on it. And if it's ultimately bad for all of us, uh, they don't care. Because what they're thinking about is, oh, I've got a house, I've got a family, I've got kids, I want to kill germs. They're not thinking about the larger system. And that's what we're doing to ourselves in the digital ecosystem also. This is a bit of C code. It represents a C library function that has existed since, I guess, the late 60s. Um, all it does is grab characters from the input stream and append them to the input buffer until it receives either a new line or into file, and then it returns the original buffer. Um, you should be able to tell from this, if you're not a C programmer, and if you're not familiar with the, the bug, you should still be able to tell that this code does not know the size of the buffer that was passed to it, um, which means if you pass it, uh, a 10 byte buffer and then it receives 20 bytes worth of input, then there are going to be 10 bytes of garbage that are going to be somewhere else in the stack that is not in the buffer that you wanted them in. Um, so this was the entry vector for the very first worm I ever heard of, which was the Morris worm, 1989, because this was part of the finger D. Uh, um, which is sort of like who is, but for B older BSD systems. Um, and yes, in those days we enabled all services on every system because we were crazy, uh, but we were on networks that only had other scientists and government contractors on it, so it didn't seem like the big problem then that it obviously turned into. Um, anyway, it, it's a bad idea. This is bad design. This should never have been coded in the first place. It should certainly not have made it into the C library. But I wanted to see what would happen, so I called it from FreeBSD, and FreeBSD at the link uh, stage told me you should not be calling get s. And then when I ran it at the execution stage, it did something that almost no C library function ever does, which is to pollute the output stream with a warning to say you should not be calling this thing. So I gave it a five character buffer, I entered 10 characters, you see, that uh, I had an overflow variable following my buffer that got filled. Okay, this is nuts. This is crazy stuff. This is worse uh, than a lot of the bugs that we see in old programs written in assembly because C gives you this, uh, C kind of is a macro assembler in some ways, uh, but it gives you this artificial sense that you're working with a real programming language and you're not. Um, in any case, I wanted to know uh, I'm a BSD guy still, it's just my, this is my comfort zone, but I figured Linux would have got this right because it has a much, much bigger user base, it's got more eyeballs on it. Um, no. Uh, Linux does not even give you a warning. Linux puts into the man page information about why you should never use get s. Um, but if you do, you just get what you get. Now. There's probably one programmer in a thousand who is going to read the man page for every function that they are calling out of the C library and find out if it's a good or bad idea to use it. And there's probably one in a hundred thousand who will look up the man page in, for every function that is called by code that they are receiving, that they're taking ownership of rather than that they are writing for the first time. 
In other words, this, what Linux is doing is not a solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is to take this thing out. Just have it be that programs that depend on it stop working. But nobody wants to do that. Because if you do it and your competitors don't, then they're going to have more customers because those customers are going to have more code that runs. And so um, I asked Kirk, Kirk McCusick, who was on the POSIX committee for the C library. So there's an ANSI C library and there's a POSIX uh, thing that came later. And he knew, I knew that he had known about the uh, Morris worm and I knew he knew about GetS. And I asked him, why did you not pull this out? Why is it something that is, uh, st why does this still live? Why is this still in computers I can buy today? And he said, well, the uh, POSIX people were only willing to remove it if the ANSI people said that they would remove it and the ANSI people wouldn't talk to me. I guess the ANSI people had other stuff to do than keeping the world safe, which we all do. I love this quote. This is so cool. As long as people write parsers and connect them to the internet, I'll have work. That was written by somebody in this room or one of your colleagues in some other city in the world. Um, because, honest to God, if, if people would stop doing this, we would, you, know, you and I would have to find actual honest to God work. We might have to you know, pick up a shovel and do physical labor. But instead, they keep doing this, and so we get to keep doing what we do. Um, and I do want to note that the first uh, botnet I ever heard about using industrial control was an HP printer network because the old HP uh, printers came with a Telnet server that had a fixed buffer and so what you could do is overwrite that fixed buffer with your own return oriented operating system that would turn the printer into a bot. Give it a lot of capabilities that HP certainly didn't know about. Um, who thinks of this? We all do, uh, unfortunately. So we're trying to secure technology that we don't understand, uh, which is a fool's errand. Uh, we don't know what technology we have. Uh, we certainly, if you have a, uh, a refrigerator that is IoT connected, you probably didn't imagine that it had the bash shell in there, and so shell shock running on your refrigerator Sending spam for third parties was probably a bit of a surprise, even though you've, uh, you're in this room and you've been uh, sort of watching this story unfold for decades. Um, all software, as I said earlier, has bugs. We just don't know what they are yet, sometimes. Um, and that means that the risk that all of this has in common is our own lack of understanding, uh, which comes from unmanaged and unmanageable complexity. Um, in other words, uh, we and the people we are protecting are not stupid, but we are self-deceptive. We want to put our head in the sand and think our own thoughts and not have all of these facts, inconvenient facts, intrude on us. This is a waveform that has two purposes. It is inside of older music synthesizers. Uh, every instrument sound in an older synthesizer has one of these, so a guitar sounds different from a piano, even if it's playing the same frequency, and the, the difference is uh, this waveform. Uh, and it has four parts, attack, decay, sustain, and release. Um, sometimes the sustain uh, is left out and you just have ADR, but ADSR was kind of the gold standard for a long time. But it can be repurposed, and it was by a very, very smart man that I met at Digital Equipment Corporation back in the 80s. You may remember, DEC, they made VAXs. Uh, they were the number two computer company in the world after IBM in 1988. Um, no one was able to explain to them why Unix and Sun Microsystems was a threat, so they're dead now. Um, anyway, so if you remap that and say that uh, this is going to be our model for the return on technology investments, um, so the area under the curve is the total lifetime revenue. And uh, the top of that curve is created first by A, which is your time to market, then by D, which is the time between you and your first competitor for that new bit of innovative technology, S, which is your time to your first Chinese competitor for that uh, technology, and then R is the time until somebody 
somewhere comes up with a better, better way to do whatever that is so that your product can't be sold by you or anybody who copied it from you. Um, what you want to be focused here is what do, you, what do you control? As an innovator, you control A, and the others are controlled by your competitors. And that means that every successful innovator is going to optimize for the steepness and length of the A leg. Um, steeper it is, the less time, and the uh, longer it will fall after it, uh, after it finally reaches the market. Um, you may be able to tell from this that there's no incentive to think about the safety of your product. The people who are buying innovative stuff want the innovation. They want the bling. They want the extra buttons and lights and things that blink. They do not care if it's going to cost them privacy or if it's going to help create botnets out of printers and so forth. They, they, they want the features and the rest be damned. Um, and that, that won't change. Um, there's no amount of uh, reprogramming we can do to the market environment to get rid of this. Uh, the people who focus on A are going to be buying the assets out of bankruptcy of the people who focused on anything but A. That's uh, economic Darwinism. So I gave a variation of this talk about a year ago at the Hackers Conference in, uh, in California, and um, somebody got up and said, hi, I'm thus and so, and I'm a grad student at Stanford, and I just don't see the problem. Right? This is how things have always worked. And we're doing fine. And I, I put this slide in just for him. Behold the field in which I grow my fox. Lay thine eyes upon it, and thou shalt see that it is barren. Uh, the idea right now, the thing that's popular among the 20-something set is to, uh, to say zero fucks given. Sorry if I'm offending anybody with my language. Um, but the idea is that the less you care, uh, the cooler you are. And... Um, I guess that's another reason why we're going to have a little bit of trouble getting this, these problems ever to be different. Um, frankly, I'm not, I, I've lost hope. I don't think I'm, that by talking to you about it, I'm going to get you guys to somehow, I don't know, mobilize as, a, as a, a people's army and get out there and fix this. I'm telling you what I know is true and what I know is always going to be true because I'm monetizing it. I am organizing my career and my company around the fact that this problem will persist forever. So, I am a minor public figure. I invented uh, the RBL that is used for all email reception today, real-time black hole list, started the first anti-spam company. Um, there are people in the world who would pay $200 to kill me just because I've pissed them off in some way. I'm not worth much. At $250, they'd say, no, I'd rather you know, go out and have dinner. But at $200, they would kill me. And I got to say, these cars, when we have driverless cars, they are not going to be better than the, the technology that's in your laptop or your smartphone, especially when we start getting into um, apps where the car is able to uh, download apps that will you know, help you with, uh, enhance your direction finding. And what's really going to be great is when the cars start doing car-to-car -car protocol instead of talking through their respective clouds. Um, so yes, I expect to be uh, wandering down some sidewalk some, in some American city sometime in the next 30 years in a car for no reason anybody knows is going to swerve out of the way and do its very best to kill me because I am worth $200 dead. And that's, that's, we're, we're lowering the cost of killing people to that just by the self-driving cars. Apple eventually gave up on Windows QuickTime. At first, they had QuickTime for Windows because they wanted the QuickTime format to take off. Um, they didn't want it to be something you had to buy a Mac or I don't even know if the iPhone existed at that time. Uh, but they didn't want, want you to have to own an Apple product in order to benefit from the QuickTime format. And so there was a Windows app that would play these things for you and it had bugs. Um, all software has bugs. Um, and I guess Apple wasn't as comfortable programming in Windows as they were in other environments, and so maybe they had some extra bugs. But um, it had vulnerability after vulnerability. If you look up the CVE history on Apple QuickTime for Windows, you'll see that it's a mess. It's even worse than my stuff. 
Um, but the, here's the problem. When they finally gave up, they just announced in a press release that there would be no more patches. Now, the total number of people who saw that press release and said, oh, I'm running that, I better de uh, delete it and not you know, have that feature on my Windows system anymore, is a grand total of zero. So we just have this permanent infrastructure of code that has known vulnerabilities on it that will live until ultraviolet radiation finally kills off the plastic case of whatever computers have this software in it and people finally replace them because they look bad. I really think Apple could have done us a favor by announcing one last patch that would disable the, the whole thing and make it delete itself, but that would have had liability problems. Finally, I was on a website and it said, uh, you know, here are other articles like the one you're reading. Database config issues expose 191 million voter records. 18 million targeted voter records exposed by database error. And it asked me, do I want more like this? And I realized I'm going to get more like this. We all are. So um, it's true that most of the money being made by the services we consume is through advertising. But it isn't just advertising. Uh, there are companies who do their capacity planning based on how many buyers of a certain type of thing exist in a certain region. Uh, sometimes they're planning on taking away your alternatives so that you'll drive uh, the cost of some grocery that you have to have, like you know milk or something like that, up by a few pennies. And they can do that by buying metadata from Facebook and Google to find out exactly where the buyers of those products are. Um, and so what you'll see is that there's extreme value in knowing what other people are going to do uh, or what they have done. And uh, it doesn't matter if you're a government, law enforcement, military, intelligence, corporate, even religious and political uh, people need to know who we are and what we're like and what we're likely to do. And um, any actual autonomy or actual privacy that any of us have is a threat to those interests. And that's why there's so much pressure on uh, sort of getting our data out there, right? There's, there's nobody but you benefits if you have privacy. So we are certainly going to be um, increasing the size of the attack surface as we have done. It's, uh, I, I think we've um, reached a pretty steep part of the curve. I'm expecting a million time increase in the attack surface uh, in the next year or two. Um, and if an IoT device is uh, not phoning home, if it's not telling, if you have a thermostat that's not telling uh, Nest or some manufacturer uh, when you change your, t your uh, the temperature of your house, uh, then again, that company is going to die from corporate Darwinism. Um, because if you're making a light bulb, for example, and sticking an IoT controller in it, you're never going to make back your R&D cost on just the, uh, the, the profit you made from selling the device. It's a commodity. People are price sensitive about their light bulbs. Uh, but if you can then put those people into a social network, then that's where your profit's going to come from. But the problem is the companies that are running these networks uh, have no idea how to secure anything, let alone all of their customer records, so, or even their own networks. So it won't just be the devices, it will be all of the backups. Everything that is uh, supporting that device behind the scenes is going to be as insecure as the device itself. Um, do we think that IoT devices will be patched? Um, I don't. Uh, I, I wish that there were laws about that. Um, I, I think, for example, we could uh, have them expire. The device hasn't been patched in a couple of years, it should stop working. If it's industrial, an industrial control device, it should have a timer in it where it blinks red for a month and then finally just says, I'm sorry, I won't take any more commands because I haven't been patched recently enough because all software has bugs. You just don't know what they are at the time you were shipped. Um, and I don't see regulation as much of a hope. Um, so let me say, I have another 20 of these, which I don't have time to do uh, justice to, uh, but I want to say uh, D-Link, 400,000 IoT devices. Um, 
And here's an MRI machine. I've actually had a brain MRI for various reasons, and I find it fascinating that uh, the results of that MRI are now cast in doubt because of vulnerabilities and bugs that were found in the MRI machine years after I had mine done. Uh, again, if anything was going to be right, it would have been a medical technology. Thank you, Lenovo. I'm still buying your products, but I realize you've got zero days that will bypass Windows. Um, this was uh, the Mirai botnet, which I can't roll my R's the way Miko does. Um, Lexus was bricking its cars for a while with an over-the-air upgrade. Um, NSA absolutely intends to find bugs in people's pacemakers so that they can target assassinations without bullets. Great. Um, this was so cool. TP-Link had um, some device configuration domains where every device they had made would uh, do a DNS lookup in order to discover its configuration. Then they didn't pay the bill, and so now somebody else owns those domains. Um, I don't know who thinks this stuff up, but you could, if you made a movie that had a plot this absurd, you couldn't sell it. You couldn't sell a ticket to it. Um, everybody knows about Flash. You may not realize the number of times that the Zen hypervisor, which is used in uh, Rackspace and Amazon and so forth, has had bugs that allowed people to sort of come in the side door and scan the uh, memory images of the hosts. But uh, if you heard about uh, any of them, that's, it was this. Now, this was cool because it's kind of a double-edged sword if you think about it. Yeah, you fixed 108 bugs, but that means I have 108 fewer bugs, but where did 108 goddamn bugs come from? And how many more remain unfixed? Right? I don't know if I wanted this number to be larger or smaller. This was very cool. And of course, Volkswagen, not to be uh, left out by Lexus, decided to brick a few of their cars, um, but you can also open them with uh, any smartphone. Now, what can we do? I told you, this is not a call to arms. I'm not trying to fix this anymore. I have been ringing these alarm bells for my adult life, and people just keep saying, well, that's Paul. He always wants things to be better. Now I'm just telling you, they're going to stay bad. You should just organize yourselves. You should get whatever training, make whatever investments you, you, you feel are necessary, because this is the future. But there are some things that you could at least do for yourself, even if it won't change the, the digital society of which you're a part. Uh, and the biggest single thing I can tell you is uh, figure out the real total cost of ownership. Make sure that as you invest in new technology, you invest in things that will increase the top side of that fraction so that your understanding level does not go down over time because it is that uh, understanding level and the, the gradual trend downward of that that is the real uh, fundamental element of insecurity. And if you make something secure, it's going to be harder to use, right? The uh, reason people don't put really expensive, really nice locks on their door isn't just that uh, somebody will break a window. It's that they themselves won't use a lock that requires uh, enough procedural getting in and out the door that it would actually be secure. They want to press one button and they want to get in or they want to get out. And that's where all these Bluetooth locks are coming from. Um, so, um, I'm open for questions. I've said a lot of controversial things. I intended to provoke some of you to disagree with me. Please don't disappoint. I have a... Uh, hi, hi, hello, hello. I have uh, one quick question. Uh, uh, who will pay for this? I mean, if you have to uh, put the security in IoT or IFC devices that are this small and this cheap, who will pay for this? The vendors, governments, people? Well, as I tried to explain, there is no model other than regulation that would actually cause that money to be spent up front. So 
Um, it's possible in Europe that since regulation is not the uh, evil curse word that it is in the United States, that you could do something here that might have some impact around the world. Uh, but I think what's more likely is that the spending will occur after the fact. Um, and I, I think um, if there's any hope of um, sort of tempering this before it really grows out of bounds and, and we get a, a major collapse, uh, it would be the insurance industry because they are going to start to understand that these cars aren't safe or that your house isn't safe because of that Bluetooth lock on the door or whatever. Uh, and they are very good at figuring out the ways in which you're not safe and charging you in advance for them rather than having to pay uh, claims in arrears. Um, but ultimately, no, we're just not going to see. If, if you had an option to buy... I don't know, one smartphone that was certified by some security geek that you, uh, that you trust uh, and another smartphone that wasn't, and the one that was certified cost more, you would pay more, and probably half this audience would pay more. But as you leave this building, the number of people willing to pay more for that uh, goes to zero. Yes. <laughs> and um, how to manage companies to understand that regulation is not something to struggle them, but to protect the consumers. Do you have a strategy? Do you have an idea? Do you have a suggestion? Pray or whatever? So, um, the, uh, some bright person back in the, I guess, 90s uh, decided that the purpose of a corporation, that its goals ought to be to increase shareholder value. Um, this turns out to be not actually right. Uh, to the extent that our economies, our governments, our systems of laws, our societies allow us to band together in corporations and therefore act as a single uh, aggregate legal entity for the purpose of owning property or making investments or whatever, they do so uh, with the expectation that we're going to make things better for society, not just for our shareholders, right? That's a privilege that we're granted in exchange. It's a, it's a social contract. Um, and so the social contract is much broader than shareholder value. Uh, nevertheless, the um, companies who behave this way produce very rich executives. Uh, they also own Maseratis and so forth. And so convincing them that they're doing this wrong is uh, hard. It's very hard to tell somebody who has been tripping and falling in piles of money their whole life that they've been doing it wrong. Una pregunta más. Una. Here you have one. Paul. Hello. Hola. 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 Thank you very much for the presentation. <laughs> I guess there's no hope, but is there some hope in the cloud or cloud versus IoT or something like that? What do you think? Thank you. Well, I think that um, we just had another Amazon outage, uh, S3 outage this week, and uh, we found out how many things we do online depend on Amazon for their uh, backing store. In fact, Amazon's own status page depends on Amazon for the, the, the red blinky thing, so that's why it stayed green. Um, so the cloud tends to be operated by the best of the best. It's the cream of the crop in terms of who is designing it and who is maintaining it. And it does not face the same uh, race to the bottom sort of commoditization of technology that the computers we can actually buy and put in our buildings or our pockets will do. Um, however, everything has limits. And there is, uh, because of the uh, dependency problems, it ends up being that the impact of a bug uh, is very large, even if the frequency of such bugs is very small. And so the, at the equilibrium point, uh, a cloud operator or a cloud customer is uh, going to be doing the same thing that a non-cloud operator, non-cloud customer would do, which is minimizing their spending. 
They're going to invest the bare minimum of whatever they have to spend, uh, either in capital or expense, to get their job done. And in order to find and then maintain that equilibrium, they're going to have to steer into troubled waters from time to time to prove that they could go no lower. So uh, my answer is no. There is not hope coming to us from the cloud. There would be hope for the small number of people who can tolerate the wackiness of open source software. Um, certainly there is no macro capability in Libre Office to correspond to what Microsoft put in. Um, but there's a whole bunch of, I, I can't use LibreOffice in my daily work and you probably can't either. So most people can't tolerate the, uh, the, the reduction in feature that comes along with uh, having greater understanding or greater control. Um, so as far as I can tell, we're going to stay right on the edge of, uh, uh, of calamity, uh, except for the days that we steer into calamity. Okay, thank you so much, Paul.